Once again, Ruth chapter 1. And we're looking at that last paragraph. Ruth chapter 1. Beginning at verse 19. Verses 19 through 22. We looked at most of the chapter last week. But preserved this last portion um, for this week. And hopefully the reason for that will become clear. I think what the author is doing here um, in this last section um, is, is very pointed and very purposeful. There are really three movements within the chapter. Uh, we looked at two of them last week. We'll look at the last one this week. So look with me there, beginning at verse 19. So the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? She said to them, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Amen. If I were to give this message a title, it would be why we miss our blessing. Why we miss our blessings. And when you talk about missing your blessings, um, oftentimes people automatically have this assumption that what, what you mean is, you know, the Lord was, was trying to bless you, but then you did something wrong or you didn't do something right, and so you, 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 you missed your blessing because... You know, you, you, didn't, you didn't take advantage of the opportunity or whatever. Um, that's not what I'm talking about here. When I talk about missing your blessing, I'm not making the assumption that the blessing was there and somehow it passed and that you missed it that way. When, when I talk about missing your blessing, what I mean is the blessing was there. It, it never went anywhere. You just didn't see it. You, you, you missed it. I don't know if you realize it or not, but we see far more than we see. Now that sounds like a contradiction, right? We see far more than we see. Let me explain it for you. Like right now, if you look up here, you're, you're looking at me and, and, and you see me. But even if you're looking like right here, right between my eyes, and you're focusing right there, your eye is actually taking in far more than that. Your, your eye is kind of like, a, you know, on the TV screen. If you go to a, a movie with a big screen and you focus on the middle of the screen. There are things happening all around the screen that your eye is taking in, but your mind is not focusing on. Your eye is seeing far more than you are even capable of focusing on at any moment. So what we do is we make choices and we prioritize things that are within that screen that our eye is taking in. And what we can do is we can actually focus on something and then consciously decide, now I want to focus here, or now I want to focus there. Now I want to focus here, or now I want to focus there. But all day long, we're walking around missing things that our eye is actually taking in. That's what I'm talking about here. When I talk about missing your blessing, I mean God is blessing you has blessed you, but oftentimes you miss it. And we miss it because of two things. There are two, two main points here. We, we miss our blessing because of what we choose to focus on, and we miss our blessing because of what we fail to focus on. And we see that here with Naomi. 
she misses her blessing because of what she chooses to focus on and because of what she fails to focus on. First of all, let, let's look at what she, what she chooses to focus on and how she misses her blessing because of what she chooses to focus on. If you look there, there's really a frame here in this paragraph, in this text. And the first part of the text mentions Bethlehem twice. The last part of the text mentions Bethlehem once. So in verses 19 and 22, we see this mention of Bethlehem. Look at it with me, if you will. 19. So the two of them went, two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, that's the first part of the text. Now go down to verse 22. So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, with her returned from the country of Moab, Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. So, 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 so that's the frame, if you will, this coming to Bethlehem. But in the middle of that frame, we find something else. In the middle of that frame, we find this interaction between Naomi and the women. And in this interaction between Naomi and the women, we get a clear picture of what Naomi has chosen to focus on. Interestingly enough, she's chosen to focus on the middle of this frame and not the outside of this frame. The narrator is making it very clear that she's doing this. Very clear that she has this myopic focus and that she doesn't see what's going on around it. We talked last week about the fact that hardship can make you have bad theology. Amen? Hardship can make you have, bad the have theology that you would not accept otherwise. There are things that you will believe on your worst day that on your best day you would call heresy. Amen? Or on your best day you just wouldn't go there. There are things that would never come out of your mouth on your best day. But on your worst day, you'll say them repeatedly. And in fact, most people won't even correct you on it. Because they'll say, ah, I, I know, <laughs> it's just under these circumstances, right? And that's what's happening here with Naomi. Look at what she says in verse 20. The, the women ask, is, is this Naomi? She says to them, do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara. Mara means bitter. Naomi means pleasant. Or it can even mean sweet. She says, no, don't, don't call me sweet. Call me bitter. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. Three times in the chapter we see this word bitter. We saw it once in verse 13. Look back there in verse 13. When she's having this interaction with her daughters-in-law and she's trying to tell them to, to stay there in, in Moab. She says in verse 13, Would you therefore wait till they are grown? Speaking about her sons. Remember we talked about Leverite marriage and the idea that under normal circumstances there would be another son in the family who would who would marry them in order to raise up offspring for their fallen brothers. And Naomi's basically saying, even if I had a son tonight, by the time he was old enough to fulfill this obligation, um, it would be too late for you. So she says, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. So in verse 13, she says bitter. And then in verse 19, she uses the Hebrew word for bitter twice. She says, first, call me Mara, call me bitter. And then four, the Lord has dealt very bitterly with me. Three times here in the course of this chapter, we see this word, this idea of, of bitterness. It's a common Old Testament theme. Hamlin points this out in his commentary on Ruth. 
We see, for example, in Exodus chapter 1 and verse 14, that the lives of the slaves in Egypt were not just made hard, but they were made bitter. They were made bitter with hard service. In Exodus 15, 23, the people in the wilderness could not drink the water of Marah because the water was bitter. In Jeremiah 31, 15, Rachel's voice is, is weeping. She's the voice of lamentation and bitter weeping because her children were no more and she refused to be comforted. In Isaiah 38, 15, King Hezekiah couldn't sleep. He says, because of the bitterness of my soul. In Ezekiel 27, 31, at the fall of Tyre, the, the, the Mediterranean, the merchants of the Mediterranean wept in bitterness of soul and with bitter mourning. In Lamentation 3.15, the people of Israel were personified as a mother of Zion and complained that God has, quote, filled me with bitterness and sated me with wormwood. And then, of course, there is Job in chapter 7, verse 11, and chapter 27, verse 2. Job protested in bitterness of his soul. And he says the Almighty has made his soul bitter. So again, the use of this here in the book of Ruth is not something that's seen in isolation. The idea that she's communicating is an idea that we see throughout the Old Testament, this idea of, of bitterness. And the word picture is most clear in the bitterness of the stream at Mara. You can't drink the water because it's bitter. You're, you're thirsty. You're parched. You're, you're, you're in desperate need of a drink and you find a stream and as thirsty as you are. And you know what it's like when you're really thirsty and then you finally see the water. It's almost as though right before, the, 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 the greatest thirst you experience is right before you get to the water. Because just before you get to the water to quench your thirst, your mind is reminded once again of how badly you need it. And now imagine you come to the stream. You're thirsty. It's hot. You found a place to drink. You kneel down, you scoop up the water, you put it in your mouth, and you have to spit it back out because it's bitter. Can you imagine how bitter water has to be for you to not drink it when you're thirsty? When you're really thirsty, water can taste a bit off. It's okay. You just say to yourself, oh, this tastes a bit off, and you continue to drink. How bitter does it have to be for you to be thirsty and not drink. That's the word picture. That's what Naomi focused on. That's all she saw of her circumstance. In fact, it wasn't just what she saw of her circumstance, it's what she saw of herself. She defined herself by that bitterness. Do you know anybody who does this? Do you know anybody who right now, today, continues to define themselves by the circumstances in their past? Who continues to define themselves? You, you, you get to know them and within a few minutes you hear about the struggle that they endured when they were a child. Do, do you know anybody who, who, who mistreats or mistrusts other people and constantly blames their past? Yes, I, I do. I, 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 have a, I have a problem with trust because I was hurt in the past, like 30 years ago. And today I'm still struggling with trust. Or, or the wife who says, you know, I, I find it difficult to, to submit to my husband. Why? Well, because, because my, my father was this kind of man. Wait, you mean your father who you haven't lived with in 10 years since you've been married to this man? who you're still making excuses about not being able to submit to because of who you, you see, I'm defining myself by those past circumstances. 
this is what happens. We have a problem with anger. And instead of confessing that sin and repenting of that sin, we, we, we point to something in our past that characterizes us. Yes, I do have this issue, but it's because. And ultimately, when we do that, what we're saying is this. I am this way because of what God forced me to endure. Because of the bitterness that God put in my life. And it excuses me to define myself in this way. And that's what Naomi's doing. Don't even call me by that name. Because that name doesn't characterize not what I've experienced, but who I am. I am deciding to hold on to the bitterness of this experience and define myself from here on out. So much so that I would change my name so that everyone who comes in contact with me knows that I am who I am because of what God did to me. That's where she is. And that's where some of us are. Continuing to define ourselves by our most bitter moments in our life. And when we do so, we miss our blessing. Listen to this from the pulpit commentary. Naomi's theology as indicated in the expression, the Almighty hath caused bitterness to me exceedingly, need not be to its minutest jot endorsed. In other words, we don't have to take all of her theology. Uh, on the one hand, Naomi's theology is right in that she recognizes the sovereignty of God. Amen? She recognizes that nothing befalls you that, that doesn't come from the hand of God. But, but what he's saying here is that we don't, have to, we don't have to accept her theology in the minutest detail, not every detail of it. Fundamentally, she's right, but not completely. God was not the only agent with whom she had to do. Much of the bitterness of her lot may have been attributed to her husband or to herself and perhaps to her forefathers. It is not fair to ascribe all the embittering element of things to God. Much rather might the sweetness which had so often relieved the bitterness be traced to the hand of him who is the Lord God, merciful and gracious, abundant in goodness. Do you follow that? God has dealt bitterly with me. That's our only explanation. God has dealt bitterly with me. Could it be that Elimelech should not have left the land of promise and taken his family to Moab? Amen, somebody. But, but she doesn't want to do that. Or could it be that it's her forefathers in the age of the judges who brought about the famine because of their disobedience to God? The answer is absolutely. But it, it doesn't have to be either or. It doesn't have to be, you know, this, God, is, God is just after me. God is just picking on me. It doesn't have to be that. Because what God is doing is bringing judgment and proper judgment. And instead of focusing on those individuals and perhaps the entire community of God's people who brought that bitterness upon them, Naomi just says, God's not being fair, essentially. Remember I said there were two problems here. First, she decided to see herself through this lens. Secondly, she decided to see God through this lens. I went out full and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? 
She's blaming God. Again, proper theology says nothing comes to me unless it comes from the hand of God. But proper theology does not ascribe evil to God. And that is basically where Naomi is right now. God has done me wrong. God has not done right by me. Have you ever been there? Again, this is one of those things where when, when life is good, we, we can recognize this and we can parse out our theology. There we go. We can be careful with our words, right? And we can say, no, we recognize this and that, and, you know, God is sovereign, and, you know, but, but he, he, you know, in his sovereignty, he does this, and he's, you know, he's not the cause of evil, and he's this, that, and the other. And now, all of a sudden, the wheels fall off, and life is bad, and we sound just like Naomi. If you can't say amen, you ought to say ouch. And our theology gets wrecked because of what we choose to focus on. There are other options. Job 121. And Job said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That is a better expression of the theology of the sovereignty of God. Job 5.17, Behold, blessed is the one whom God reproves. Therefore, despise not the discipline of the Almighty. It is as though he is speaking directly to Ruth in this paragraph. It, it, it is as though, you know, if, 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 if Ruth is here, if you could take Bible characters and, and put them in interactions with one another, you, you would take Ruth's words, you know, don't, don't call me Ruth, call me Mara, the, that God has dealt bitterly with me, the hand of the Lord is against me. And you would almost put Job right there, seated in front of Ruth, saying, my sister, I love you, but behold, blessed is the one whom God reproves. Therefore, despise not the discipline of the Almighty. Because right now, you're despising the discipline of the Almighty. And you're missing your blessing because of it. It's okay to be hurt. But you don't have to be wrong. Amen? It's okay to be hurt but you don't have to be wrong. And if I can just put a pin here. When your life is difficult, when your life is bitter, that's when you have to fight for your theology. Because your natural tendency is going to be to go right where Naomi went. Your emotions are going to kick in and if you're not careful, your emotions are going to take over. And you will begin to say things and you will begin to believe things that are completely contrary to your theological convictions. And if you're not careful, you will stay there. And many of us right now probably have people in our minds that we're thinking of right now who, 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 were, who were walking, it appeared, through the narrow gate. Who were walking on, on, on the straight road. And then some difficulty came in their life. And they began to say and think and believe things that were contrary to their theological convictions. And now they haven't been in church in years. They spent the last 5, 10, 15, 50 years shaking their fists at God because of something bitter that happened to them that they thought they did not deserve. And they missed their blessing.
we should remember the words of the prophet. In Lamentations 3, 31 and 32. For the Lord will not cast off forever, but though he cause grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love. Well, remember, I said there's two things that cause us to miss our blessing, two reasons that we miss our blessing. One, the things we choose to focus on. And two, the things we fail to focus on. And if you remember that frame, what we just looked at is the middle of that frame. But if you look at the outside of that frame, now before we look at the outside of that frame, there's a bigger frame in chapter 1. The frame from 19 to 22 is a frame where you have the same thing on both sides. You, you start with Bethlehem, you end with Bethlehem. In the middle of it, you have something different. But there's a frame around the whole chapter. Look at chapter 1 and verse 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a man of Bethlehem and Judah went to Moab. I mean, went to sojourn in the country of Moab. He and his wife and his two sons. That's the first part of the frame. There's a man from Bethlehem who leaves Bethlehem with his wife. Now look at the close of the chapter. So Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab and they came to Bethlehem. See, this frame is the opposite. There's a message in both frames. The, the, the message in the broader frame is God took them away and God brought them back. Amen? There's a different configuration when they come back. But God took them away, God brought them back. God took Naomi away with her husband and her sons. God brought Naomi back with her daughter-in-law. That's the broader frame, which points to the blessing of this latter part, the blessing that Naomi is missing. So now within that broader frame, there's another frame. Look at the smaller frame again. Verse 19. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. Where were they driven out of? Where, where, where did Elimelech take them away from? He took them away from Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, twice in the same verse, he mentions Bethlehem. The whole town was stirred because of them. And then in verse 21, read verse 21 again. In verse 19, two times we see Bethlehem. They're coming back to Bethlehem. Remember at the beginning they go. There we go. Remember at the beginning of the chapter, they go away because there's a famine. Now look at verse 21 again. I mean verse 22, I'm sorry. So Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. They didn't just come back to Bethlehem. They came back to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. She missed her blessing because of what she chose to focus on. And she missed her blessing because of what she failed to focus on. What did she fail to focus on? She failed to focus on God's promise. There's three things she failed to focus on. She failed to focus on God's promise. She looked at her circumstances and not the promise of God. She failed to focus on God's multi-generational promise of a place where he would dwell with his people. They came to Bethlehem three times. Bethlehem is an incredibly important place in the biblical storyline. It is a small and insignificant place geographically. You, you hear about Bethlehem. I, I remember the first time, you know, going to Bethlehem. I was so excited, right, 
to, to go because it's, it's Bethlehem and you go to Bethlehem and you stand there in Bethlehem not, not far from Jerusalem and you go to Bethlehem and it's like there it is great where's the next stop and yet it is one of the most significant places in redemptive history we start way back in Genesis. In Genesis 35 and Genesis 48, we're reminded that the matriarch Rachel was buried in Bethlehem, which was significant because it was almost like the first fruits of the land of promise that was held by God's people. In 1 Samuel chapter 16 and chapter 17 and chapter 20, Bethlehem was the hometown of King David and the place where the prophet Samuel anointed him as king. It was Bethlehem. We also know that in Matthew 2, 16, that Herod had all the male children from Bethlehem killed who were two years old and younger. Why? Because of a prophecy made in Micah chapter 5 about Bethlehem. Micah 5, 2. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you shall come forth from me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. God himself would become incarnate as a man in Bethlehem. We miss our blessing when we fail to focus on the promise of God. Even in the midst of our worst circumstances, if we focus on those circumstances and fail to focus on the promise, we will miss our blessing because our blessing is in the promise, not in the circumstance. Secondly, we miss our blessing when we fail to focus on God's people. Something very interesting happens here. Notice that when they come, the whole town was stirred. And then the women speak. And both of these things are incredibly important. The whole town was stirred. Why is that significant? Because the whole town is involved in Naomi's blessing. In fact, when, when the deal is done, when the deed is done, it is at the city gates where Boaz and the other redeemer finally in front of the whole town settle everything so that Ruth can become his bride. The whole town is involved in this process. The whole town is involved in this law and this tradition that is going to redeem Ruth and redeem Naomi. The people of God. God uses the people of God in order to bless Ruth and Naomi. But my... If you focus on your circumstances and don't focus on the people of God, you miss your blessing. You miss your blessing. But not only that, but the women. The women show up twice in this book. And, and, they, and they show up as a, a, a sort of chorus. In the first part of the book, the women show up and they say, is this Naomi? And it's a backdrop for Naomi's words of bitterness. The women show up one other time at the end of the book. Look at chapter 4, beginning at verse 14. 119, the women ask a question, and they're the backdrop for Naomi's, for Naomi's words that, that are in error, that miss the blessing. They show up again in 414. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a redeemer, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap, and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. C can you see the other frame here? 
Two times the women show up. One time they show up and Naomi gets to speak. And she speaks bitterness. The other time they show up, Naomi doesn't get to speak. The women speak and they speak blessing. Naomi missed the blessing. The women didn't miss the blessing. Thank God for the people of God. Amen? Thank God for the people of God. Because remember our scenario? Bitterness comes into your life and you allow the bitterness to change your theology. You begin to say and to think and believe things that are in error. What do you need at that moment? You need the people of God who are outside of your circumstance to remind you, sometimes gently, but sometimes to take you by the scruff of the neck and shake you and say to you, God is good. Yes, this circumstance is bad, but God is good. Don't you forget that God is good. Isn't it interesting? She goes away with her husband and her two sons. That's where you start. At the beginning of chapter 1. And at the end of chapter 4, the women remind her, you have a grandson. But not only do you have a grandson, but you have that Moabite woman who is more to you, not than two sons. What do they say? She's more to you than seven sons. Significant biblical number. More to you than seven sons. Do you see the picture being painted here? The people of God are a blessing. And you will miss your blessing if you divorce yourself from the people of God in your time of bitterness. The promises of God, the people of God, and last, the provision of God. Again, <laughs> Naomi's bitter, but why do they return? Go back, chapter 1 and verse 6. Look at chapter 1 and verse 6. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. Why'd she leave? Because there was no food. Why'd she come back? Because there was food. And at the end of verse 22, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. The beginning of the barley harvest happens early in the year. It's the first of the harvests of the year. The beginning of the barley harvest happens in that uh, March, April time of the year. That is significant because if there is a good barley harvest, that's the first harvest of the year, then it's an indication that the people of God will live in plenty for the remainder of the year because of the good barley harvest. And because there's a good barley harvest, there is much to glean in the fields from the barley harvest. She misses her blessing. The beginning of the chapter, she and her husband leave because there's a famine, there's a drought, there's no food. At the end of the chapter, she and her daughter-in-law come back, and they come back at the time of the barley harvest. They come back because they heard that God had bountifully blessed and provided for his people. Can you see? Because she couldn't. All she could focus on was right there in the middle. These horrible, bitter things that had happened. She decided to define herself by that. And she decided to define God by that. And so here she is coming back to the land of promise. To Bethlehem. Literally the house of bread. 
and she is so blinded by her circumstances that she misses her blessing because of what she chooses to focus on and because of what she fails to focus on. And that's you and me, saints. We miss our blessing because of what we choose to focus on. We choose to focus on the bitterness. We choose to define ourselves and to define God by our bitterness and our circumstances. And we fail in the midst of that bitterness to remind ourselves of the promises of God, to surround ourselves with the people of God, and to rejoice in the provision of God. Don't miss your blessing. Don't miss your blessing. Because as we continue to say here in the book of Ruth, this is a multi-layered story. This is not just about Naomi missing her blessing. Think of Israel. Think of Israel under the judges. Bitter with God because of this dark age in the history of Israel. And in the midst of this dark age in the history of Israel, the story of Ruth reminds Israel. It sits right there in the Bible in a place designed to remind them that the king is coming. And for Israel, all they're able to see is that King David is coming. But for us, we see another one coming from Bethlehem. The one that Micah reminds us of. And I will note that Micah reminds us that one is coming who is eternal. King David is a man of flesh. He came and he died. His kingdom was an earthly kingdom. It came and it went. But King Jesus, the descendant of King David, is the God-man whose reign will know no end and whose kingdom is not of this world. Don't miss your blessing. Don't miss the blessing that is the person and work of Christ. Don't miss your blessing that is the one whom God sends to be a substitute to die for your sins on the cross so that you might place your faith in him and be redeemed. Don't miss your blessing. Don't miss your blessing by focusing on your circumstances. Don't miss your blessing by mischaracterizing who you are and who God is. But instead, Remind yourself of the promises of God, the people of God, and the provision of God, specifically through the person and work of Christ, so that your focus is broadened, and so that you're reminded that in spite of the most bitter circumstances that you will ever face, God is good. Let's pray. Our great God and Heavenly Father, we bow before you in humble gratitude, thanking you for your goodness and kindness and mercy toward us, and confessing to you that we often miss it. We miss our blessing because of what we choose to focus on and because of what we fail to focus on. By your grace, may we lift our eyes to the hills where our help comes from. So our help comes from the Lord. 
grant by your grace that even in the midst of our bitterness and hurt, we will broaden the scope of our focus and never miss our blessings. We ask this in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen.